Hi everyone, welcome to today's program, Black Maternal Health Week, Amplified Black Birthing Experiences, a conversation with Kimberly Seals Allers and Mashariki Kutumu. Today's presentation is a re-recording of the original presentation. Along with the March of Dimes, Los Angeles Public Library provided programming books and community resources to uplift Black mothers and their families during Black Maternal Health Week. At the end of this presentation, there will be a slide listing community resources. Now, without further delay, I will introduce you to facilitator and library partner, Mashariki Kadumu, Director, Maternal Infant Health at March of Dimes. Mashariki will introduce Kimberly Seals Allers and she will talk more about Black Maternal Health Week and her um, app, Birth. Thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Madeline. And we're grateful, March of Dimes is grateful for our partnership with the Los Angeles Public Library and during Black Maternal Health Week and as we continue our activities. So some might ask, why are we focusing on Black maternal health? It's because we're in the midst of a dire maternal and infant health crisis. The US is one of the most dangerous places to give birth in the developed world. Race of preterm birth, which is one of the leading causes of infant death and maternal mortality are increasing. Data from the March of Dimes shows that the preterm birth rate has risen for the fifth straight year in the US, California, and Los Angeles County. And according to the CDC, approximately 700 women die each year in the US because of pregnancy or delivery complication. The majority of these deaths are preventable. And also too, there's unacceptable disparities in birth outcomes between black women and babies and their white counterparts. In LA County, Black babies are two to three times more likely to die before their first birthday than babies of other races. In addition, Black women in LA County are four times more likely to die because of pregnancy complications than women of other races. Education, insurance coverage, health behaviors do not explain this gap because Black women with college degrees have higher rates of preterm birth, low birth weight, and infant death than white women who have not completed high school. And research also shows that Black women report more instances of discrimination and mistreatment during pregnancy and birth. Chronic inequities, racism, and unequal access to quality health care are the root causes of these disparities. And the Black Maternal Health Week campaign was founded by and is led by Black Mamas Matter Alliance, and it takes place every year between April 11th and 17th, and is a week of awareness, activism, and community building intending to shift the narrative of Black maternal health from, um, from disparities data and to amplify community-driven policy, research, and care solutions. And so we are thrilled to be here today for this event to uplift liberation, freedom, and joy in Black birth. We are happy to change the narrative to provide solutions because when we know that when we care for and improve the health outcomes for Black women and our most vulnerable neighbors. We improve the health outcomes for all moms and babies. So join me in welcoming Kimberly Seals Ellers. Kimberly is an award-winning journalist, a five-time author, strategist, tech entrepreneur, and advocate for maternal and infant health, a former senior editor at Essence and a writer at Fortune Magazine. Kimberly is a leading, comment a leading commenter on birth, breastfeeding, motherhood, and the intersection of race, policy, and culture. She's also a frequent contributor to the New York Times and the Washington Post, Slate, and others, and as a director of various on-the-ground community-based projects across the U.S., Kimberly is also deeply rooted in the lived experiences of mothers across socioeconomic spectrum. And she brings all of these experiences to bear and her strategic advertisement for clients, her advocacy efforts, and her vision for a world that supports mothering as valued work. Kimberly is a graduate of NYU and Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. She's a divorced mother of two, and she lives in Queens, New York with her children. Welcome, Kimberly. We are so happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And so I'm just really intrigued by your background. You are a tech entrepreneur, you're a journalist, um, you are a researcher, you're an author. How did this all come together? And really why were you interested in Black maternal health? 
Well, I think as a journalist, I'm always interested in asking questions and following the thread to find answers that make sense, right? And I think that idea of digging for the truth and, and wanting to be, you know, I am a storyteller at heart has been at the core of everything that I do. So, you know, I had a great career in journalism, as you were saying, and was really grateful. It was my dream since I was six years old to be a journalist. Um, but when I became a mother, I, you know, everything really shifted for me. In fact, while I was pregnant, I became became aware of the same types of inequities that you were just describing. You know, I was blessed to be educated. I was blessed to not be poor and had no idea that these were not protective factors for me um, and that I was still at a very high risk. And when I learned that during my own pregnancy, I was scared. And, but I also was really upset that there weren't any more substantial answers, right? So this was, you know, going on almost 18 years ago um, when I had my first child. And so, you know, we weren't having this robust and phenomenal conversation that we're having now. And at that point, there was very little research. Dr. Fleeta Mass Jackson was doing some research, but there was a very nascent conversation about the role of racism, um, the way that it weathers our bodies, its impact on birth outcomes. Um, and so, that really bothered me that there weren't any real answers, any clear answers, any across the board, you know, nationally accepted answers. Um, and so my very first book was a pregnancy guidebook for black women uh, called The Mocha Manual to a Fabulous Pregnancy that really looked at pregnancy and birth from a sociocultural perspective, right? Like what's going on in, in, in the lived experience of black women that could be contributing to these outcomes. And so that book really kind of uh, set me on the path, you know, the research for it, the work that I did in the community, the ways that I was able to travel, having these conversations in many different places across this country um, and in others, uh, really laid the groundwork for the rest of the work that I began to do, both in community, uh, in the community research, and ultimately now thinking about how do we move technology and other media formats um, into this, this kind of quest to improve Black maternal health outcomes. I love that. And I also love that you talked about the research of um, Dr. Fleeta Mask Jackson because she's really uplifted um, the birth outcomes for educated, college educated Black women and middle class Black women because. I think a lot of times when we talk about birth outcomes and the disparities, people want to always go to it's because of health behaviors, it's because you know Black women are poor, and her research really is changing the narrative around that. And you talked about Mocha Manual, and I think, um, and it fits into that sort of changing the narrative and filling in this gap when we talk about um, Black maternal health and what resources and support Black mamas need. And so when you did that, um, when you did that book, what was the gap that you were trying to fill in for a pregnant Black woman? Um, I think that I was trying to fill a gap for myself, right? Because I was a pregnant Black woman when I was working on that project. And, um, you know, the gap was that we didn't have any answers. We didn't really have any information from other people who look like us. Mm -hmm. And so again, because I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical practitioner, but what I did try to do with the book was to interview other people. Like that's what I know how to do and to bring in research and to bring in others voices. And so I really wanted it to be a community where you could see and hear from other people I had celebrities in the book like Lila Rashawn and Nicole Ari Parker and, you know, like just the whole gamut of experiences, um, you know, all the people that I interviewed. And so I wanted it to be kind of what, you know, what we have more of now on social media, but basically a, a way to hear um, and see other Black women. And that was really important. And I also love when people talk about the Mocha Manual because the um, the mama, the Mocha mama we call her on the cover was also, you know, a very stylish image of Black women that had not been seen. You know, motherhood was really dominated by a white female narrative and we were not seen in it, particularly not in a stylish or kind of way. It was, you know, kind of very different for us. And so to your point, this idea that, you know, either we're only focusing on the mammy trope, like we saw black mothers on television as taking care of other people, but somehow we were viewed as incapable of taking care of our own. We saw black women on TV as disciplinarians, but not loving, you know, nurturing people, not, not intentional parents, right? And so all of these ways that we could dispel uh, stereotypes was really important to me. And that was the gap I was really trying to fill um, because we weren't being seen in that conversation. It. And 
I also love your book, The Bit Lockdown, which explores the culture of infant feeding and this idea of first food deserts. And so I'm really interested in your work around breastfeeding, supporting um, women of color around breastfeeding. And what did you learn in that book and how can we really um, create change and a culture of change around breastfeeding in our communities? Yeah, I mean, I learned so much in that book, Mashariki. Um, I'll try to put it down me first. When I began the First Food Desert work, I had the privilege to be in a, in a fellowship program with Institute of Agriculture and Trade Policy. And it was one of those weird things that I applied, ended up being at a, a, a get together that they had here in New York, and really started seeing these people doing amazing things around food. They were talking about food deserts and how do we garden and sustainable agriculture. And I, it dawned on me that people don't think of infants as being part of the food ecosystem, right? Um, and so I was talking to the director, really started to make those parallels. I'm like, I assure you that in those same places where people are struggling to get a banana and healthy fruits and vegetables, that those infants are most likely not getting their most nutritious food either. And that requires a different type of support. That requires supporting the mother for that to happen. And so it's a, it's a different model. Um, and so I applied to that fellowship after their, with their encouragement and um, became the first person to be in this food fellowship talking about breastfeeding as a food systems issue. And my time there was really around understanding these parallels, right? And so, for example, in, in our food world, we go around and say to people, hey, you should eat well and exercise, eat well and exercise. But people really never before checked in to see if that was actually possible where they live locally. You know, was there a safe place to exercise? Is the food um, accessible and affordable? And so it was, it sounded right, but wasn't really connected to lived experience of people's lives. And so I found that that was very similar to what was happening with breastfeeding. We would tell people, hey, breast is best, you should breastfeed. But do they have the support to do it? And do they have that support in their community where the majority of your breastfeeding journey happens? And so this idea that, you know, kind of exploring that there are actually communities that don't have the supports that mothers deserve and need to successfully breastfeed, particularly for any meaningful duration, became the foundation of that work, which was supported by the Kellogg Foundation. And I got to test the idea in Birmingham, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, New Orleans, and really began to see, well, we can take community-centered ideas is, and then take them to the community and test them and build our knowledge and our research that way. Um, because and similarly, where there's a hierarchy of, of what is research, anything in the community is usually at the bottom as well. So it was really amazing. And that's really the lens that I brought to the big letdown in my book that um, there's a whole system that's happening. Many people, when they don't have the breastfeeding experience that they wanted, they often blame themselves. I blamed myself when I was having so many challenges and I'm like, what's going on here? All of these women who, who I knew who were so successful in many other areas felt like quote unquote failures when it came to breastfeeding. I'm like, it can't be us. It can't be all of us, all of us. And so I really started to research what is this behind the scenes thing? Um, if you look at the history of the ways that infant feeding has been co-opted, the ways that commercial interests have been involved, the, you know, what happened when they figured out that they could make a substitute for mother's milk? Everything kind of went downhill because now the commercial interest kind of superseded everything else. Um, the role of pediatricians in supporting that commercial interest, which we has continued to this day, the role of feminism and kind of not necessarily valuing mothering as important work um, as something and breastfeeding as something that could be viewed as demeaning to mothers, so to women. And so all of these things have created a landscape for where we are. And that's what the big letdown is about. It is not to teach you how to breastfeed. I'm not a lactation consultant, but I wanted to open up the eyes of uh, mostly mothers and those who are lactating people around the issues about why it can be so difficult and why we have to put in the extra work to get the support. And how do you dismantle some of those systems that you talk about that sort of get in the way of Black women and women of color breastfeeding and how can we support them? And tell us about the work that you're doing around um, Black breastfeeding with your being a little um, um, modest and uh, you're doing amazing work around the breastfeeding space. So tell us about how we can support women of color and your work around um, Black Breastfeeding Week. 
Yeah, I mean, the story about Black women and breastfeeding is so amazing. I am the co I am uh, the creator and co-founder of Black Breastfeeding Week, which happens every year, August 25th to 31st. I hope everyone watching will uh, find out about the local celebrations um, because the history of breastfeeding is also in this country for Black women is also the history of racism, of oppression. We, we know now that during when Black women were enslaved that we were stopped from breastfeeding our own children and often forced to breastfeed the children of our white oppressors because they knew the milk was important, right? And they knew they wanted it for them. And that meant that our children suffered. And this created a disconnect. You know, I mean, when you think about it, a mother's first job is to feed her baby and to be denied that. To be, to be forced to do that for someone else while your own children suffer is something that none of us can imagine, right? Um, and so this began a disruption of the Black motherhood experience, which for mo every mother begins with feeding um, their baby. Um, and and that, that generational trauma still remains. And so we see a disconnect for as long as there have been, they have been collecting breastfeeding data, there has been a huge gap in breastfeeding race between white women and black women. Um, and some of that is just the history of the ways that white women have been centered in that process. For example, and I talk about this in my book, when we look at how models of support were developed in this country, they were modeled after La Leche League, an amazing organization. They've done incredible work to support breastfeeding in this country, a lot of strides legally, but their model was based on women who were not working outside the home. And so now you had a whole model that was replicated that was built on one type of mother and basically women of color have disproportionately always worked outside the home. And so now you have the model of support that was really a model of support for one kind of person. So, you know, when we look at that history of how breastfeeding support even evolved in this country, we can see um, how and why particularly Black women have been left. And so during Black Breastfeeding Week, we try to celebrate, you know, in fact, we do celebrate. That is all we do. We share images. We have lots of community events. Every year we have our annual lift up is, which is where people congregate in different places, parks or whatever at a set time. And we lift up our babies just as a public demonstration that we are committed to their health, their nutrition, their education, their love, their, their well-being. Um, and we really try to lift up the community around awareness um, and to say that we are breastfeeding, right? And this, and we are actually in a reclamation work, taking back something that was taken from us um, and really reversing a, a, um, a break in, in, our, in our birthright as mothers that we are now taking back and encouraging others to do that. So I get excited about, about Black Breastfeeding Week, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, and I love the title, like, you know, reclaiming, right? Um, and changing that narrative because there is that narrative out there. And, um, and it's so important now to be able to see Black women breastfeeding and to see all the um, systems of support when we talk about cinemoms here in LA County um, that really is supporting breast, um, Black women and breastfeeding. When we think of like all the different um, Instagram accounts and things we could see on social media where beautiful Black women breastfeeding their beautiful Black babies is just so important for those images to be out there to kind of disrupt that narrative. And I love the work that you're doing around that. Um, and then what, we're here to talk about Earth too. I love your Earth app. Um, is a game changer. And so this app is a, a Yelp-like platform for black and brown families to come together to share their reviews around pregnancy, birth, um, what happened in the hospital, their pediatrician and their parenting. So tell us about Earth and how you got started and, um, and what, you know, what's the aim of and your goal in creating this tech for us? Yeah, and thank you so much. So, you know, Earth, like everything that I've done, kind of started in the community, you know, when I was kind of doing that work on the ground, always hearing these stories, right, whether there was a mother who died near death, disrespect, just all across the board, you know, and that work, that's how the Kellogg Foundation spread to Detroit, that went to Philadelphia, that was working on the West Coast, and it was just like every place I went, it was the same story, and I was just tired of 
always hearing the same story. And I went to a number of funerals for mamas that I didn't know, but people were mourning when I was working in the community. And I sat at one saying, "We, I, I, this, this has to stop, right? This has to stop. And really, to be honest, as a journalist, my mind went to how can I put all these stories in one place? And then I began to think bigger, like what's the power of a digital platform? What's the power of it being public? And so what Earth really seeks to do is on the front end, it has this public facing Yelp like review and rating platform where you were asked very specific questions about what happened during your prenatal birthing um, or pediatric experience, right? So we encourage people to use that. Go in and search, put in your zip code, see what how many reviews are there um, and see what you can learn. Um, but also to leave a review for your community because as we're thinking about Black maternal health and the ways and the solutions, one of our solutions has always been each other, right? One of our solutions has always been checking in. And I think that is something that we've always done, whether it's a, a hairstylist or you know a church or whatever, we always gonna ask somebody who looks like us that we trust where to get good soul food. Like we're, we're gonna ask somebody who looks like us um, because we know that because we trust them. And so I often say your community is a resource as you're birthing and earth is a way for you to see what your community is saying. And then on the back end, we work with hospitals to to turn those qualitative experiences into meaningful data that we can now go to them and say, listen, we have 5,000 reviews from the LA area. This is what people are saying. Their pain levels are being dismissed. You know, lack of eye contact, um, diagnostic test delayed. We just did a little Earth mini report and we found the number one negative experience being reported in Earth right now is requests for help being refused. Mm. That's the number one, requests for help being refused among people of color. And so that's very telling. That's very telling and very disturbing. And so we want to be able to get to the details because unfortunately, the other thing that I realized was that the hospitals were, um, you know, kind of, and I, you know, they, they were doing the anti-bias work, but it kind of stopped with the training. And that's an important start. Even California has mandated that for um, many healthcare professionals in your state, but what about the accountability, right? So how do we now use something that's community centered, that's public mm -hmm. to bring transparency and accountability, one to the hospitals themselves, and to processes that are putting in, being put in place to help these hospitals on their journey. So that's really what we're about at Earth. We just started our first hospital pilot in Detroit. So I'm hopeful if anybody out there wants to talk about an LA pilot hospital, please reach out. We, we are looking to learn. Um, we are looking for hospitals that you know believe that this is important, that believe that bias-free care is a human right and that black women deserve to be treated respectfully. Um, and they wanna understand what that looks like to us, not to them, but to us. Um, and then the last thing I will say about why I get so excited about what we're doing with the hospitals is that, you know, uh, many times in this approach, there's like a one size fits all, right? So it's like, okay, you go to a training, it's 90 minutes, I ask you about your childhood, blah, blah, blah. But I remind people that racism looks different in New York than it does in LA. It looks different in New York than does in Mississippi, right? And so we need this hyper-local data. We need to understand what it looks and feels like for the people in your community, dear hospital, right? And not just taking some national model and saying all black people are the same. And if we do this, it'll work. It's, that's not what, what we're learning. And so we want to give hospitals um, and providers uh, this, this local information. And then ultimately that we build earth as our good housekeeping seal of approval, and that providers will earn our trust by, by using Earth, by getting good reviews, by taking our courses, and that that is something that we look for as our beacon to say, are you Earth approved, right? Is, is, has that hospital earned this accreditation? Has they, have they earned um, this, re, this, this acknowledgement from my community and people who look like me? And so that's really the vision and we're super excited about getting started. We have such great response. Um, and I'm just so honored to bring this uh, small gift into the world to be a contribution to all the great things that are going on to address this issue, because it's gonna take all the things. It's definitely gonna take all the things. So we need to leverage technology. We need to leverage consumer forces. We need to push all the buttons we can. You're so right. It takes all the things, right? And this sort of multi-system, multi-prong approach. Um, and we're so excited to have Earth, uh, you know, in LA. We had an amazing launch a couple of weeks ago um, over Mother's Day weekend. It's something that's come up around the app is, you know, hearing Black women say, like, I wish I had known about this app, right, when I was pregnant, or, you know, that I would have, like, looked at my 
Opie who did wrong by me um, and really wanting that information and having that accountability is something that we're seeing with Earth, something that we're seeing in the work that you know Dr. Karen Scott out of UCSF is doing is this whole framework about really the black experience because and holding the hospitals accountable and giving that information because the um, you know, patient satisfaction surveys that are put out, people either don't fill them out or the questions that they ask aren't really getting to what our experiences are. So having these platforms that really look at the birthing experience, the hospital experience from the black and brown's perspective is so important. Um, and, and it really and is- it to be public, right? Right, like, for it to be public. complete that survey, you don't know where it's going because it's not gonna be shared. Right. And that's been the other thing too that folks are talking about. So I completed this survey, so what happened, right? I completed this survey, I told you about this, um, you know, staff person at your hospital who was disrespectful to me. So what happened, right? Um, and it just goes into a abyss and people don't know. So to have that information out there in public and to really, and what you're doing is not about um, shaming, it's about empowering, holding accountability and then working with these systems to improve. Um, and, and also, I want to say, Mashrika, I mean, one of the things that we always say, I, and I tell this hospital, I want to make you the Airbnb super host of the Earth platform, right? right? Those who are doing well, we want to celebrate that. I read all the Earth reviews and people come in all the time saying, this person is great. I want my community to know about it, right? So we always lift that up. And I think that when we can start our analysis to look for patterns, when we, we, we want to look at those hospitals that are getting good reviews and say, hey, what's going on there? You're getting great reviews. Maybe there's something that can be learned there that can be replicated elsewhere, right? And so how do we now use this system to identify the leaders and celebrate them, you know, uh, make sure that people know that. And, and that's an important part that we want people to want to, to be celebrated by black and brown folks. Um, and then for those who are for a lagging, how can those, how can we learn from the leaders to help the laggards? I mean, that's really our model um, and to really lift up and amplify those who are doing well. And that's so important too, right? Because when we talk about Black maternal health, it's always on the disparities and we don't amplify that the majority of Black births um, are good outcomes and what works, right? And so we want to know like what works, what is a positive experience, who's doing well in our community, who's doing well by our community. And so I love um, that like amplifying what is working. And also one of the things that you're doing in your work is really sort of changing that narrative and amplifying Black joy and amplifying Black positive birth experiences um, in your in narrative nation and so wanting to hear more work around that and why um what was you know the call behind that um and having your podcast and other platforms out there yeah i mean i felt really i was deeply concerned that the narrative in black maternal health and this has been directed mostly by the media has been very negative right um they only cover it really when there's been a a, a high profile death um, you know, it always starts with the negative statistics. And, you know, that's that's how you stoke fear. And I started seeing it. I think I wrote this piece maybe about three year, four years ago, saying, I'm getting concerned, people. <laughs> I'm getting concerned. And so now it's got to the point where I get emails. Um, we, we get messages on earth, like people are afraid. People are asking about completing death documents before they give birth. I have fathers reaching out fearful for their wives and, and, their, and their loved ones. It's ridiculous. And I'm like, you know what? Fear has been used to control black people since we got here. Actually, that's how they got us here. And so we have to be really careful around this idea of fear. And so it was important to me um, in, in both Earth and in my podcast, which is called Birthright, uh, Stories of Joy and Healing in Black Birth, that we say, actually, we can learn from the living. Because on the hospital side, you know, it's really important they do these maternal mortality review boards. That's great, important work. But why do we have to die for you to analyze our experience? And so that's another key thing with Earth. We want to be able to learn from the living right. and then give those, give those lessons to the hospital before mm -hmm. we die. So we don't have to die. This idea that they want to learn after we die is, is, is unacceptable and backwards. Um, and so on, on the Earth side, we, tr we try to look for uh, trends and links. Like, so for example, we know that in many of our sister's deaths that dismissiveness about pain has been a very common thread pretty much in every story. Um, and so if we see that with high frequency at a hospital, how do we 
use Earth as our early detection system to say, hey, these things are, are coming up for you often. And let me tell you, nine times out of 10, this leads to an adverse event. So let's, let's, let's clean this up right now because we see that it's happening a lot within your institution. So how do we learn from the living and not wait so that people so that people don't have to die. Um, and then on the other side of that work for me is really centering Black joy. I believe joy is a tool for us to leverage in our fight for birth justice, and that we can also learn from positive birth stories. Right? It is happening, as you're saying. And the you know the if you read uh, if if you kind of listen to the mainstream media narrative, you would think it is not happening at all. But when I tell you how many submissions we get for people who want to share their story, you know that thing that is so interesting, Mashariki, about this was that people were actually afraid to share because the, the, the narrative has made us feel lucky to be alive. The narrative has made us feel that we should be lucky if we are alive. And so to even speak of joy has felt taboo for many people. They, they didn't want, they felt bad that they had a good experience. That mm -hmm. makes no sense. And so we have to, we really have to, uh, fix that. Um, mm -hmm. And so on Birthright, I share positive Black birth stories. We also do healing circles and we had a great one. I hope everybody will check it out while you're here on YouTube. Uh, check out the Birthright Podcast YouTube page when you're done watching us um, because we did a special episode, which we call our restoration episode, where we take two, we had two uh, mamas, two Black mamas who had a negative birth experience. And we sat them down with a therapist and a healer to take them on a journey, right? Because we need to be a demonstration of healing as well, because you may not have had a joyous experience, but you can heal. And we need to show that, like you can get to joy through another pathway. And so on Birthright, we center positive stories. We take mamas on a healing journey for those who have not had a positive story. And I'm really excited about being that contribution to the Black maternal health narrative um, and that we, we cannot fear our joy. As Black people, we have never forgotten our joy. That is how we are still here because we always centered our joy and found joy in something. And we need to bring that energy uh, to the Black birth movement. I love it. I love it. And what would you tell, you know, because I hear the same thing in the community, right? Women who are afraid um, to give birth, who are afraid to go into the hospital. And so what are some of the things that you're learning from your podcast, from the Earth app, like that you would give if there were, you know, one or two nuggets that you would give um, Black pregnant and birthing people and families um, to kind of uplift that joy and to, um, to go into their experience with some tools. Yeah, so important. Um, one of the things that I always talk about is, and we see this a lot in Earth, and we talk about this a lot on the podcast, is the need for us to really lean into our consumer hats, right? Um, and that really, when we think about it, I tell people, like I said, you need to interview your doctor like you would a new hairstylist, right? You need to ask all the questions, all the questions, because really trying to tell people what to do at the hospital is too late. You need to find out from day one whose team this guy was on or this woman. Is this person on team vaginal delivery or not? What's their C-section rate? These are the early questions. When you get a vibe that this person is not communicating with you, not answering your questions, if you can, get another provider, mm -hmm. right? If you cannot, what are the support solutions? LA has a number of great doula service, doula programs. Can you have a doula who could actually help and be an advocate for you? If not, can you have, how can your partner or the father be, be uh, supported and being and, and talked to around being serving in that advocacy role? Um, what are the tools that you can gather? Is a childbirth center birth or a uh, birth under a midwifery care model an option for you? That is the most important thing, but you, but you can't do all that if you wait to the last minute to decide that this provider is disrespectful or you think that you can do something in that hospital room when you're there and, and you know ready to push it's it's highly unlikely and so what we really want to do is encourage folks to do that front end work um, researching asking questions trust your instincts when someone's not treating you right um, and I like I said interview that person like they were going to be working on your hair and ask a lot of questions a lot of questions right um, and if something don't come out right we are we are out of there we are out of there so we have to bring that same energy to that secondly of course we tell people to birth with earth we actually have a free ebook available for download 
at the earthapp.com website where we do have some tips um, as well as going into earth, put in your zip code, search to see if you can see some reviews that could help perhaps, you know, calm your fears or perhaps make you realize that maybe you need to be more prepared. And if you see something that you don't, don't like, tell your provider, hey, I was checking out earth app um, and I didn't like the reviews that I saw. How can you talk to me about what you're doing differently? And these are important things. Uh, and then I would say, you know, always one of the things that I love here on the podcast are the ways people center their faith and their spirituality in their birth experiences. And I think that that is always beautiful to me. I'm giving myself goosebumps. Uh, <laughs> thinking about some of the great stories that women really share um, and mamas share around the ways that they bring their faith, they bring their spirituality, they bring their blackness to their birth to make sure that even if it is one small thing that they could hold on to, that they could create, that is that is them. For them, that is joyful. When people come on the podcast, I don't define what a positive birth experience is. If you feel that was the case, then please join us. Um, and so the ways that people are finding joy um, by bringing something that means something to them to their birth experience, I encourage people to find a way to do that. Um, and then never give up, you know, like be clear about what you want, speak up, use your voice, it matters. Um, and that's an important tool that we, we, we have to always leverage. Um, but again, it's more effective the earlier on in the process. And then let's not forget that it's not up to us to save ourselves. Ultimately, you know, I'm here and Earth is here to hold the system accountable. The system that we're actually paying um, for our health care needs to be held accountable. Uh, and so we, we are doing our part, but we are asking and expecting and demanding that the system does its part as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for lifting up some of the resources in LA. There's two community-based doula programs for Black families, the LA AIM doula program, as well as the frontline doula program. So please feel free um, to Google those programs as well. I also want to let the audience know about the Marcia Dimes COVID-19 birth plan. We updated our birth plan to have questions regarding COVID. You know, what does a prenatal care look like during this time? What does um, labor and birth look like, breastfeeding, to be able to navigate these conversations with your provider, to get your wishes um, out there so that you know, so your provider knows um, what um, your wishes are and also to, to have these conversations because as we know, things are changing and guidelines are changing almost sometimes daily. So to be able to have those conversations and to have these tools, as you said. So there's tools out there that families can have, but also to knowing that um, we have to ask for systems to be accountable and to look within themselves, what are they going to do to create um, systems of equity, responsive um, and respectful care for all birthing families. So I appreciate you for lifting that up. Where can folks find you as we close out? Um, where can folks find that um, Earth app? Where can they find you on social media? How can people connect with you? Oh, well, you can find the Earth app any in any place you get your apps in the Google Play App Store, the Google Play and the Apple App Store. Uh, I R T H. Remember, it's like the word birth, but we dropped the B for bias. So look for I R T H. Um, and so, and you can learn more at EarthApp.com. Please check out our website. We have resources there that are helpful, articles, and certainly you can go there to grab the links to download the app as well. Um, you can find out about the Birthright Podcast at Birth rightpodcast.com. You can learn about me at KimberlySealsAllers.com. And also please follow um, the Earth app on Instagram and Twitter and me at IMKSealsAllers on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So we're all the places, Mashariki. We're, we're out there. We're out there. And I love it. There's so many ways for folks to contact you. And please do connect with Kimberly and the wonderful work that she's doing to really um, uplift Black and Brown families to change the narrative um, and just provide us with some tools and resources. Thank you, Kimberly, for your time today. I really appreciate it. I really I am thankful for our conversation. And we um, will bring up some um, resources, community resources for our audience um, to check out, to connect with others in the community who are doing this work. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you for having me. Wow, guys, thank you so, so very much. Um, it's really groundbreaking and, and hopeful and really interesting work that you're both doing. Um, I say groundbreaking. Um, 
you know, which it wasn't groundbreaking, but it is. And I, I appreciate all of the effort and time that's gone into creating something like Earth. Um, just what a great resource. And I can't wait to learn more about how it's exploited in the community and used um, and, and how people can make those connections with facilities um, that meet their needs and how facilities can work to do better. Um, and so again, thank you so much for your time and for coming back and re-recording this session. And we had so many tech difficulties last time. So um, I'm going to right now um, do a screen share and I will probably all disappear. <laughs> so I don't expect you to come back after that. We're just gonna end with putting the additional resources up on the screen. Um, so once again, thanks everybody. And if you have uh, other suggestions or questions for the library, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can communicate with us at www.lapdel.org. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Here come the resources. <laughs>